I'm Peter Block in Chicago at the AHA Annual Meeting for On the Scene. With me to my left is Kim Eagle from Michigan and further to my left Deepak Bott from the Brigham and Women's in Boston. Uh, they used to say the three amigos and now we just say you know, with the three guys standing up <laughs> trying to do the first or second day, sorry, wrap up. So these are the trials that we think are the important ones for the day. I'm going to start out with, of all things, renal transplantation. Who'd have thunk, right? But the fact is that if you have a renal transplant, uh, you still have an AV fistula from your dialysis. And there is a trial at this meeting that showed that closure of the AV fistula, a randomized trial, uh, makes a difference in what your heart sees immediately and what happens to your heart. So the pathophysiologist of us say, wow, this is sort of interesting stuff. So I'm going to throw it to you. What do you think about this? Left right shunt closes, uh, the heart gets better. Why does it get better? What do you think is going on? You know, it makes a lot of physiologic sense because on the list of causes of heart failure is AV fistula, in particular high output failure. So, I mean, every now and then in the cath lab, I've done patients like the right heart cats to see if they've got high output failure and whether closing a shunt of any sort would be useful. So I think it's a fascinating uh, hypothesis. They tested it in a randomized way and it reduced LV mass, yeah. LV volumes of all four chambers, BNP, so yeah. looked like a winner. And BNP went way down. So uh, clearly the heart gets better. And uh, I talked to the PI and the message here is that if you've got a renal transplant that's stable after six months, you know, do a mini operation. It takes, you know, 20 minutes, close the, Close the AV fistula, you're done. Heart gets better. Yeah, it How seems bad is like that? a sensible strategy. Yeah, and it's curious, Peter. You know, these patients with transplant, um, if they have left heart failure, systolic failure on dialysis, sometimes that goes away after a transplant, which I think we always thought was sort of the physiologic effects of dialysis. But it makes you wonder if there's also a reduction in high output failure when you transplant a patient. Yeah. It's anyway, a it's a little. A little off cardiology, but cardiologists see a lot of these folks, so yeah, we do. we're there, and that's a good trial. So let's move on. Let's talk, to, uh, speaking of physiology, door to unload. Uh, Deepak, I'm going to throw this to you. Yeah, this was an interesting study, a pilot study, looking at whether uh, hemodynamic support uh, prior to PCI, uh, about 30 minutes or so, would be better than just going ahead with primary PCI. And uh, the study found that uh, you know, the 30 minute or so delay that's induced by first implementing uh, mechanical support before just doing it at the time of PCI you know, seemed to be a safe strategy. Of course, a concern would be, is it okay to delay by 30 minutes? But at least within the context of this pilot, it didn't seem there was any harm to that strategy. I'm gonna make a comment about this, because you know, in, when this first came up and bubbled up as a concept, I thought to myself, man, why would you stop door to balloon time for 30 minutes to unload the ventricle? It takes time to put the impella in. You're always worried about getting it right, making sure the artery is big enough, and all that other stuff. I can't believe this is going to work. And now the safety issues are quite clear. It makes no difference. That 30 minute delay doesn't seem to make a difference. What's going on? Well, you know, it's a pilot, modest size, so I, I think there needs to be a much larger trial to figure out exactly whether hemodynamic support is really needed in this scenario. I, I think the medical community is calling for a, a large trial of this sort. Uh, you know, there was no true control arm in this trial. You know, it's, it's, it's a pilot, I understand, but you know, for example, we can't really say what happened with vascular complications because yeah. each, you know, each arm of the trial got the device. So. If there had been a true placebo arm, how might that have fared? So, you know, th there's still, I think, a fair number of unanswered questions, but, you know, this at least perhaps sets the stage for a large randomized trial, which I think is what we really need to do to nail down the questions of who should and who shouldn't get these, you know, expensive devices, large bore vascular axis, vascular complications occur. These were all patients that had normal ejection fractions to start with. These weren't cardiogenic shock patients. They were actually excluded. But the bigger infarcts seem to do better. So, Kim, quick thought. Well, I'm thinking if you get those early, then you have a shot at improving the survival of those dying cells. And so, to me at least, it would be logical. Bigger infarcts gotten too early, you unload the ventricle, yeah. and you really have a chance to salvage. Yeah, well, you know, you drop LVED with the impella to very low numbers. Yeah. You increase the gradient from epicardium to endocardium. You may get some more perfusion, but interestingly, there appears to be something about preparing the myocardium for reperfusion that half an hour of 
uh, uh, LV Holiday, if you want to think of it that way, left ventricular holiday, makes a difference. And when reperfusion comes, it can withstand it better, quote unquote. We'll see what happens with a randomized trial. I hope it's right. Yeah, yeah I, hope it's right. I, I think, again, it, it's interesting. It's uh, worth pursuing, but it really needs a large randomized clinical trial okay. to nail down. So more to come on this one. All right, so Kim, you've been awfully quiet, which is unusual. Yeah, I know. I, I tend to speak up a lot, don't yeah, I, Peter? Well, yeah. the fact of the matter, here's your chance. Well, let's talk about Odyssey. Uh, there we go. You know, they, they presented at this meeting the Odyssey Outcomes Trial, and this really gets at the whole design of clinical trials. You know, we often do a trial, placebo versus an agent, and, and time to first event. In this case, we're talking about uh, the PCSK9 drug, alirukumab, in patients who've had an MI in the last 12 months. This study suggests that you prevent first events with the PCSK9, but there's twice as many second events that you prevent with this agent. And it explains that, that widening survival curve uh, at three years. And this really harkens to the point that, that sustained therapy that's uh, fairly magne you know, magnified in terms of benefit has all this secondary wash effect. Yeah, but the interesting thing about this is I think about it is, yes, that's great because people got into the trial, but think about primary prevention and going back even further. What does that imply? Well, certainly I think uh, the possibility is that people with familial hyperlipidemia um, we may see that if you start agents that get LDL down to 50 or less, that you have a huge effect over a lifetime. That, those are big trials to do, of course, and we're nowhere near that. But the cholesterol guidelines presented yesterday talk about uh, potentially starting therapy in patients as young as 10 for this longitudinal benefit that could be magnificent in that very high-risk cohort. Yeah. So that's going to make a real difference in those uh, lines as they separate. I think so too, especially yeah. as the drugs become less expensive. Yeah, well. yeah I think that that's really uh, a lot of key points in there. And in fact, with prove-it and improve-it, recurrent or total event analyses were also done, and it showed that the first time to event, the classic way to do these trials, while valuable and important, can lead to an underestimate in certain scenarios. Not every scenario, if it's a drug where there's a high discontinuation rate after the first event. Are you really surprised by that, Deepak? Not really, right? I mean, you'd expect maybe that this would continue to have effect. Well, again, it, it depends on the drug. So for an anti-thrombotic, for example, maybe with the first event you stop it or you come off the drug, the trial drug, and go on an open-label drug. So, so it can be a little tricky, but at least in the lipid-lowering domain, it does seem like what you said is true well-tolerated drug, you stay on it after your event, so you've had your non-fatal heart attack, you stay on your statin or your PCSK9 inhibitor in this case, it might prevent that fatal heart attack next. So, Well, there's that cumulative effect on, on, on plaques. You know, you're, you're pacifying plaques, you're making plaques less likely to be ruptured during a course of influenza or whatever, and that is cumulative. And there's lots of coronary plaques in a patient who has an event. Yeah, yeah. and you know, we're in this for the long term. You, tally out the number of years we've been taking care of patients, it comes to about 1,200, right? <laughs> and so uh, <clears throat> when you look at the long-term events sure that here, math was right, most just... trials look at a year, most trials look at six months, most trials look at even 30 days. And right. we're talking about a long-term outcome here and long-term therapy, which we tend to overlook. Odyssey is beginning to give us insight into that. Yeah, and it's a three-year trial, and this, this sort of notion of the secondary events prevented as well begins to get us at the economics, and, and maybe you want to talk about Odyssey economics. Yeah, absolutely, but you know, as I say though, about 40% of the patients did end up getting followed up for more than three years, so there, there's at least a reasonable contingent that got at least three years, so that might have been one of the reasons, say, you know, compared with Fourier, where there was no mortality reduction, at least in Odyssey, in nominal terms, there was a, a, a reduction in mortality. But the economics you, you asked about, um, and, and I presented those uh, yesterday from Odyssey Outcomes uh, as a late breaker, and what we did there was use in-trial data, so it wasn't just some you know, theoretical modeling exercise. We used the actual uh, data from the trial and came to a value-based price. So we didn't use whatever the cost of the drug is out there because that's a fluid number, and that's right. up to the companies. That's not up to... Uh, the uh, executive committee of a trial, uh, and the magic number we came to for the overall trial was $6,300. So at that price, alirocumab would be cost effective in the overall Odyssey trial at a willingness to pay threshold of $100,000 per quality adjusted life year. So, you know, that's where it is. Now, if you go to the LDL 
greater than or equal to 100 subgroup where we saw the largest absolute benefit in clinical re risk reduction, uh, there the cost effectiveness is higher and even at a $50,000 uh, willingness to pay threshold, 50,000 per year willingness to pay threshold per quality adjusted life year, it still is reasonably cost effective. And in the LDL less than 100, in any scenario, it wasn't cost effective. Still a lot of money, but uh, at least reasonable. Yeah, but you know, again, I, my hope is, and I think at least the academicians uh, uh, among the group that did that analysis are hoping that that approach of using trial data to find the value of a drug then helps set the price of the drug as opposed to what happens now where you know it's whatever the market might tolerate, that's the price a drug comes out at. Okay, so that's the end of day two. Those, it's a good wrap up of the important stuff that's happened today. It's been an important and interesting AHA day two, thanks.